Hi, everyone. We've set up this Being an Engineer podcast as an industry knowledge repository, if you will. We hope it'll be a tool where engineers can learn about and connect with other companies, technologies, people, resources, and opportunities. So make some connections and enjoy the show. So I actually went back to the CEO and I said, this is our vision. Like, that was a PowerPoint. The solution doesn't exist. And he said, yeah, you guys will figure it out. You've been in the industry forever. You're passionate about it. Just go get it done. And so we were like, if we cash this check, there is no turning back. Hello and welcome to another wonderful episode of the Being an Engineer podcast. Today we're speaking with Julie Schulte, who is co-founder and CEO at Champfer, where their goal is to help make product development faster by connecting engineers with suppliers of medical components. If you are an engineer in the medical device space, this episode is definitely for you. Julie, welcome and thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Aaron. I'm excited to be here. So we're going to talk a lot about Chamfer and how engineers benefit from Chamfer. Before we get into that, can you tell us a little bit about your background? What what were you doing prior to Chamfer? Sure. I've been in the med device space for 20 years, almost exclusively in contract manufacturing. So the first 10 years of my career, I was actually selling to engineers. The last 10 years of my career, I was leading sales and marketing for contract manufacturing companies in various C-suite roles. Okay. So at some point, you decide that you either want to stop doing what you were doing, or you want to start doing something new, maybe some combination of the two. How did Chamfer come to be? Yeah, it was definitely a combination of both. Um, I was uh, frustrated by not being able to service engineers at their point of need, actually, and um, had an opportunity to start a company because the company that we I was working for was private equity owned and it divested in 2017, meaning we sold the business off to two different companies. And at that company, um, which was a large contract manufacturer at the time, several hundred million, we had started the first single vendor e-commerce store in med device and people thought we were crazy. But having grown up trying to service engineers, I knew that they really struggled to source low volume components early on in the design process. Um, Conversely, operations struggled to make the small volume requests and break into manufacturing to service them. So we thought if we created components in low volumes and just made them accessible to engineers at the click of a button, that would accomplish both needs that were between the the sellers and the buyers. And what what qualifies as low volume? Anything an engineer needs early on in the product development process. So, I mean, I had several engineers saying, I'm just trying to figure out what my actual product, you know, needs are and and finalize my spec. Um, So they were like, can I get one Z, two Zs, you know, 10, 20, whatever, just to iterate with in the R&D lab. And it's just really difficult to break into manufacturing for that type of request. And they were had to create a spec because nothing existed when they weren't even sure what the spec was. So it was sort of a chicken and an egg type thing. I know in my own efforts trying to source things, sometimes I'll find what I think is the perfect part, but they have a minimum order quantity of like, you know, 2,000 parts or something like that. And, and I need one or maybe two. Um, exactly. Yeah, so I, I definitely get the need there. Uh, sometimes uh, a, a supplier would be willing to provide samples, right? But other times they're like, no, you got you to buy 2,000 of them. So, Right. Um, and even uh, if they've got samples, um, I actually owned a product development consultancy um, that I had co-founded with a couple people. Um, it was focused on interventional and bioelectronic spaces. And our engineers were trying to get small volume components and they'd find the supplier and it would show that they've got this, you know, sample locker, online and they'd pick up the phone and try and call somebody and they couldn't get a hold of somebody. And when they did get a hold of somebody, they weren't sure where the inventory was or if they actually had it in stock. And so just the manual workflow really wasn't working efficiently and effectively for either side, the buy or the sell mm. side. It, I don't know if you can speak to this or not, but why why is it such a problem? Like why can't suppliers just have a process set up to deliver small volume quantities to R&D teams. What, why is that even an issue? Well, they can now with Champer. So, okay. I mean, that is before, the whole idea. Though, before yeah, before Champer, Champer. Why, why couldn't they? 
I mean, there's a couple issues. It's, you know, when you think about designing a medical device from scratch, you are starting with a blank sheet of paper, right? So you might know you need a, you know, a polyamide tube, for example, but you don't know the exact specification. So you're creating a, a document that says, here's what I need, but you're sort of guessing at that point because you don't have the device, you know, specification defined, right? And so then you have to go to the supplier and figure out who can meet that specification. And then the supplier has to then not only say, yes, we think that's within our capability range, but then go on to the floor and have the manufacturing people actually make it. So in the old model, there was nothing close enough. There was nothing off the shelf. And this is actually one of the things that it was hard for people to get their head around is like, well, the engineers bring the need. And I'm like, well, they're creating a need because they don't have anything to try early on in the process. Right. And so yeah. that's really what we tried to achieve. So it sounds to me like ultimately uh, the answer is, or was people weren't, or suppliers weren't carrying inventory. They weren't carrying any stock of these like really custom sized things because they had no idea if people were going to buy something like that. Is that exactly more or less yep. the case? And that's still a challenge today, but we're saying, Hey, the engineers just need something close enough create inventory that represents your capability range so that they can tweak and play and, um, you know, try different things so that they can get closer to understanding what they need that didn't exist yeah. before. And in fact, it is an investment for the supply side. So we've had to convince them that this is super valuable for engineers and they will go to, you know, what we call the toolbox. So Champer just at a high level is essentially like an Amazon for medical device components specifically. And there's, you know, we have, thousands of components from, you know, 40 plus sellers right now. And it's just a toolbox for R&D engineers to go in, but they're, they're buying from a toolbox of suppliers that understand what it's like to provide supply to medical device, you know, so they understand the regulatory requirements, they understand, you know, what sort of quality systems they need in place. Therefore, the buyers can use them throughout the entire life cycle of the product. Yeah. So I think this is super interesting and, and I want to provide even a little bit more history for especially maybe some of the junior engineers out there who have never even been exposed to these supply chain issues and didn't even know that it would be a problem to get uh, parts in, in low quantities. W what did engineers do before Chamfer to, to solve this problem? Great question. Yeah. I mean, they basically went online if they didn't know who the supplier was of a sp particular, you know, material or component capability, they went online and Googled it. And assuming you could find a, a good representation, they usually went to several di different suppliers, provided them a specification of something that was just sort of at that point, you know, a shot in the dark. The suppliers would then have to respond to them and say, yes, it's within our capability set. They would request a quote for these small volume. Then they'd go back to their operations team, create the quote, get it scheduled into manufacture if they even agreed to do it. Because again, just to say one of the challenges was if I was talking to an engineer and he knew what he needed, then I had to convince my ops team that it was worth you know, spending time, even if the engineer was willing to pay thousands of dollars for, like you said, a minimum lot fee, right? Um, yeah. So then they'd have to wait for the quote, get the quote, and then the quote would be associated with the lead time. So you think about, when you're trying to source components for a bomb, and let's say just to simplify, you have 20 different components on a bomb, this sort of process could delay any one component or all of them. And you just stack up the amount of time it takes to get anything, any iteration of a device in med device exponentially, right? And then the costs associated with are exponential too, because you're paying minimum lot fees for 20 different components with 20 different lead times from 20 different suppliers, assuming you could even find the right supplier for what you were trying to source for. It was extremely inefficient, which is, you know, again, why we said there has to be, there has to be a better way. I love it. I love it. Quick, uh, quick tangent here. Chamfer is spelled C-H-A-M-F-R. No E between the F and the R. I'm curious, how did you come to that spelling. That's right, Aaron. And th thank you for saying that because I don't know that that's widely known, but it is intentional. So we we did drop the E. Um, when we thought of the name, it was sort of like a light bulb moment. And we said, oh, you know, isn't that sort of like a blunt edge, giving engineers an edge to innovate faster? And we were just pumped because honestly, we had come up with 50 names that were horrible. And we'd been trying to find the name for the business for several months. <laughs> and we went online and just 
looked to see if there was, you know, we could get access to the domain and we, we had to make sure that we could, you know, rank in the Google search rankings and all those things so that engineers could actually find us since we were a new company. And the way we could own the entire space was to drop the E and not compete with, you know, other terms. So that's, that's why we ended Brilliant. up spelling it that yeah. way. Yeah. Well, I, I love the name. I think it's perfect because it, it almost filters out the people you don't want and attracts the people you do want. As an engineer, I hear a company called Chamfer and I think, oh, Chamfer, I know what that is. That's right. <laughs> design. That's mechanical. That's CAD. That's engineering. And like immediately I want to learn, okay, what does this company do? But if I'm not in the engineering space, if I'm not your customer, I hear Chamfer and I think, oh, isn't that some kind of like geometry thing? Ugh, I don't want to touch that. So it, that seems perfect to me. I love it. Well, okay. So since we've gone there, I just have to tell you, the funny thing is, is so I'm not an engineer, but I'm married to an engineer. My entire career has been been servicing engineers. My co-founder, one of my co-founders is a mechanical R&D engineer. And I was the one who came up with Champer and said, are you, is this what this means? And what do you guys think? And they were like, yes, that's the perfect term to get engineers to understand what we're trying to do. So it was kind of fun that, um, that that's how it evolved. But yeah, that was yeah. exactly oh, the idea behind it is we want great. to speak directly. We are a hundred percent targeted on servicing engineers innovating in medical device. And that's our exclusive yeah. focus. Which is so different than a lot of, of other websites or marketplaces. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that being your sole focus, medical devices, how how did you come to that conclusion that you want to service just the medical device and not just, you know, industrial, general, commercial engineering R&D needs? I mean, the business model really just evolved out of trying to solve pain points that, you know, like I said, I had experienced on trying to service engineers from the commercial side and also um, one of my co-founders uh, as an engineer had experience, you know, she was going to 50 different websites, trying to find, you know, the right capability set to match what she was trying to do, then picking up the phone and had a lot of frustration, different UIs, different UXs. And I've spent my entire career in med device. It never even occurred to me. And I've, we've had people say, Hey, you should use this model and leverage it for another industry. But we are super passionate about med device. We know med device. We've been in med device for 20 years. And our goal is just to, be the best at what we're doing in med device. That's a hundred percent. It's not, it never occurred to me to go anywhere else. I, I'm, I want to stay here for, for the rest of my career, pretty much. Well, it, it seems like a good strategy to me. Um, I've been reading Seth Godin's This Is Marketing book lately. Great book. Love and Seth. he talks about, yeah, yeah he's wonderful. Uh, he talks about how um, it, it's super critical for any business to identify what they're going to do and, and send out signals that this is the specific thing that we do and target that on, on this minimum viable market. And yep. so it sounds like that you've done exactly that. It's very clear what you do, uh, low volume medical device components for the medical device industry. Um, yeah, we, we did start, well, we started with a minimum viable, viable product. So again, we, when we started to scope the business plan and, and look at the solution we were trying to bring to market, we said, what do what's the pain point for the engineers and the suppliers and how do we get them to uh, connect more effectively and efficiently to, to alleviate some of these pain points. But as we've expanded the strategy and we've looked at functional upgrades, we are really focused on how do we make the buyer's journey easier and continue to add value for engineers. Um, and so what we're, we're really thinking about is a global network. So we've created this global network and it started out just with the in-stock components. But then we said, okay, what happens after they source, you know, this low volume component, then they need to go back and either iterate on the, the component they got or, or buy something else, right? So then we created this tool that allows them to submit an RFQ um, iterating on the component they got or, or source another component. Um, they also said, hey, you guys are really connected in this space. We've got engineers ordering from over 30 countries globally. So as you can imagine, you know, they're not necessarily intimately familiar with supply in certain geographies or certain capabilities. They said, hey, can you connect us with other suppliers on the service side or suppliers that might not have inventory in stock yet, but would be able to service us in this way? So that's how the directory actually evolved too. So we are, our entire growth strategy is focused on how do we add value to engineers? And to that regard, I would say if there's any engineers with things they want to see on the site, we're always taking feedback. And um, that's how we, that's how we track our product roadmap for sure. 
Wonderful, wonderful. We've been talking about medical device components for a little while here in this conversation. Can you uh, give us something tangible? What What are we talking about? What is a medical device component? A couple of like discrete examples might be helpful for people to hear about. Yeah, I mean, are you talking about in terms of the offering on the site? How we approach exactly. that? I mean, it yeah. started yeah. out as components, and frankly, we started out in interventional because that was sort of the background of both um, my co-founder, who the engineering co-founder, as well as um, how we grew up in the space, but um, we have expanded into several different markets. So we currently have, I would say products, and I'll explain what that means in a second, but we have it in various markets, including surgical, orthopedic, bioelectronic, interventional. Um, so there's a myriad of products within those spaces. And again, just with the mindset of what does an engineer need when they're starting to source low volume components, they're in an R&D lab. So while in the beginning, it started out as, you know, what you would traditionally think of as a component like um, marker bands or uh, heat shrink tubing or a liner or um, night null tubing or a mandrel, which is, you know, can be a manufacturing aid, introducers, guide wires, whatnot. We then expanded into both sub-assemblies, into tools and equipment. So yesterday, I think it was yesterday, we just launched some UV curing stations. We're working on getting some... Um, some adhesive on the site. We've got coatings on the site. Um, so we've expanded, we've got raw materials. Actually, we had, um, people were struggling to get resin for a while. So we reached out to some suppliers and said, Hey, would you be willing to put low volume resin on the site? And they said, absolutely. Then they said, well, when you, when you get resin, you need a colorant. So we've got colorants on there. So we've just sort of said, if it is of use to an R&D engineer and it's in low volume so they can really just play and figure out which direction they want to go and iterate quickly um, and you're willing to you know, build or stock the, the material, the product, the component, the tool, the fixture, let's put it on there. So, so it's so a one-stop shop. Big, for, yeah. That's a big deal these days. Is it in stock, right? Uh, I've, I've come across a lot of suppliers where their website says, yeah, we got this in stock and then I order it and they're like, okay, it'll be four weeks until it yeah. gets there. And, you know, <laughs> I want to punch someone. So yeah. uh, do, do your suppliers really have this stuff in stock? Yeah. And, and we, we've had to work really hard um, to maintain and, and that line where we say, Hey, this is how we're promoting it. This is what the engineer is expecting. No, you can't just do a quick, yep, we'll make it because, you know, capacity shifts, um, inventory yeah. shifts, it goes out of stock. And so if it's in the, the store um, and it says it's in stock, so we have a real time inventory update. If it says there's quantity of, you know, 10 on there and you buy all 10, it will automatically show zero in stock. And we don't allow back ordering right now. So um, we do get pressure from our suppliers that say, oh, just give us a week or two. But we, we've held firm and said if it's in the store, it needs to be in stock and on the shelf. And therefore, they can just print out the pre-printed label that gets um, produced when the engineer actually places the order and they put it on the package that's in stock and it ships within 24 to 48 hours, business hours. That's awesome. I'm sure there are lots of engineers just clapping right now hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> so what what is the kind of the journey that the engineer goes through when they're purchasing something on the website? So they arrive at, at Chamfer, I think it's chamfer.com, right? Correct. Yep. And then And then what happens? I mean, there's a couple different ways you can um, experience the site, but I think primarily if you're looking for in-stock components, you just click on either the the mega menu. I don't know how much of this language translates, but you you look for the in-stock components right at the top of the homepage. It says, you know, in-stock components. You click on there and you can filter by product category. We actually have what I call the Google search bar, although that's not it's not Google, so that's not Chamfer search bar, let's say. And you can type <laughs> in a supplier name, you can type in a material, you can type in um, a specification, and it combs the whole site, including our service partners. So I think the easiest way to, to source something is to type in the, the Chamfer search bar, because then it will show you in any product category, whether it's a service partner or the, the material is in stock on the site. Um, but once they find the component that they're looking for, you can filter by um, all of the parameters, the specifications. So the table, the product tables themselves, we intentionally designed somewhat um, like an Excel sheet so you can filter by the different attributes. 
And depending on the product category, there might be something that's more important for the engineer to filter by. Um, so it might be ID, it might be OD, it might be material, it might be length, you know, whatever it is, the, the product tables uh, vary slightly between the product categories. And once you find the product you're looking for or something that's close, it's as simple as add to cart. And we accept credit cards, they can set up a PO if it's required. Um, they can use their own uh, shipping account number. If the company has, you know, a corporate account that can be put in at checkout. So it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's literally a couple clicks of a button and the product is shipped. The supplier gets notification the minute the buyer purchases order now. And so they then the clock starts and they've got, you know, 24 to 48 business hours to print that label out and get it out the door. Amazing. That's yeah. awesome. Awesome. Yep. Well, I'm going to take a, a real short break here and share with the listeners that teampipeline.us is where you can learn more about how we help medical device and other product engineering or manufacturing teams develop turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines to characterize, inspect, assemble, manufacture, and perform verification testing on your devices. We're spe speaking with Julie Schulte today. Julie, what... We, we talked a little bit about what, what engineers can find on Chamfer. Is, is there, is there a type of engineer for which Chamfer is not a good fit? Like if you're this kind of engineer, you're probably not going to find what you're looking for at Chamfer. I want to say no, because if, if they don't find what they're looking for and they come to tell us, we might be able to solve that problem for them. But I think, okay. you know, I think we're primarily focused on the R and D engineer. Um, I mean, the site itself is intended to connect buyers and sellers and the suppliers can service the buyer at every stage of their journey. So, you know, if you think about the product development cycle, it's like you're starting with proof of concept in R&D, right? And then you, once you've got, you know, your design, essentially you're moving into preclinical and clinical. So you're still in that low volume stage. And we yeah. have had suppliers put, you know, what I would consider more than sort of the initial requirement of, you know, onesie twosies or five to 10, they've said, Hey, can we put a couple hundred on? Can we um, put a couple thousand? It's like, absolutely. If it's something that, you know, is fairly standard, that's easier to do. Obviously if it's custom, it's harder. Um, but so they can, they can service them at any point in the product development cycle. And the idea is really to facilitate the introduction of that relationship directly. So another thing that's different about Champer versus maybe, um, like a Cosina or some of the other sites is that we have full transparency to who you're buying from. So you can mm. see the vendor and you can, you know, that everybody on our site, it shows, you know, who has, um, ISO 1345 certification right now, all of our sellers do. Um, some of them, it's not a requirement, but they know that eventually to service the medical device engineer, they're going to have to get it. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, they can service them at every stage of the journey, which is why I don't like to just say it's only for R and D engineers, but that is our target audience that we're trying to serve because in, in my opinion and experience, they're underserved in, in our industry. And that's where it okay, all starts. So, that's where innovation starts. That's right. Yeah. So I'm an R&D engineer and I've ordered, you know, a few dozen components for whatever I'm testing, balloon catheter or something like that. I've got my prototypes built. Things, things are working. Um, we, we've gone through some verification efforts and, and we're starting to get into production now. Am I, am I still going to chamfer to, to order production volumes or like, how does that transition? At that point, you're working directly with the supplier. Yep. Because you know who the supplier is, you've received components from them and, and more than likely you've had to iterate, right? So it may not be an exact fit. So you can use, uh, Champer's online system to iterate. So if you order a specific component, you can go back in and say, this was the base component that I ordered. I need this tweak to it. And it will track it almost like a Slack channel so that you have a, a record and a history of what you started with for a specification and what you iterated on. And they can create, the supplier can create a custom part number in there for you and you can check out online. But at any point in the process, once that introduction has been made, you can go direct. So the engineer is then directly working with the supplier or the supplier is directly servicing the engineer. 
It, it sounds like to me, and this is wonderful, that Chamfer is really just trying to make the introduction, um, sell some of the first few parts, but then if that relationship between the buyer and the supplier continues into production, Chamfer is not trying to be like, well, hold on, this R&D engineer, that's, that's our customer, Mr. Supplier. You need to go through us all the time. You, you just make a clean handoff and, and they can work together independently. Absolutely. Our entire philosophy is to reduce friction and barriers, not create more. So we we just want an online resource that allows engineers to connect with sellers and buyers, again, whether it's services or products, raw materials, um, tooling, fixturing, um, just a quicker way of sort of making that connection and finding the people that can help them get to the next step faster. And then we get out of the nice. way. <laughs> nice. Love it. Well, what are some of the, the challenges that you've had to overcome um, building the site, growing the business, getting the word out? I think the biggest, you know, the biggest one is really just getting suppliers to create inventory. Because again, there's this there's this mental barrier to understanding that the reason the engineers are creating a spec at the very early stages is because nothing exists for them to purchase, right? Or at least in, right. in the old model. And so that that barrier was probably more significant than I thought it would be because to me, I'd been selling to engineers for so long. I knew they were saying, Julie, mm. just get me something that's close enough. I, I mean, we can talk general French sizes. It doesn't even have to have a specification and you can charge me 10 X. I just need to know which direction to go here. Right. And so, so trying to convince suppliers that if they created, you know, some, some samples to use your word within a certain range of sizes, it would be close enough was, was a hard, hard battle to fight. But once they did a lot of our early suppliers that did get it, you know, they were the ones that said, this is brilliant. Let's do this. Let's invest in it. And they've now, you know, exponentially increased their online offering. Once they started seeing the success and saying, Oh, you're right. You know, there's only so many French sizes of devices you can, you can design. Right. Within, right? So you, you, in the end, you're going to have to have an exact specification and tight tolerances and all that. But in the beginning, you're just trying to figure out if the device even works, right? So, yeah, yeah. so once people started um, investing in the inventory and realizing how turnkey the model was and that engineers were loving it, then it was easier to start getting more people saying, oh, this is, this is real. They will grab something if it's close enough. And then that became you know, a good way for them to, again, have the introduction point. And really the pandemic was a huge, I mean, that was a, a definitely positive for us in terms of just mm. uptick on the site, both on the buy and the sell side. Um, because buyers weren't going to trade shows, they weren't traveling, sellers weren't allowed to come into facilities. And so they were doing everything online. And then the suppliers kind of got desperate and said, fine, we'll try this thing you've been passionate and push about and pushing. <laughs> and, you know, it really created a very successful model for both sides. And then that gave us the moment that we needed to, to continue to expand the toolbox, if you will. Wow, that's great. Just the right timing, huh? Yeah, we got lucky there. Well, what, what about uh, surprises? What surprises have you encountered? I, I guess you, you mentioned one already, which was you didn't expect the, the suppliers to be such a, a challenge to create this offering. Any yeah. other surprises that you've encountered that, that you just like, wow, where did that come? I hadn't even thought about that. Well, I mean, we, so we bootstrapped the entire business. Um, we, we quit our day jobs. I mean, to be fair, we had side hustles in the beginning is what we called them. So we said Champer is our primary focus, but we're going to maintain a side hustle, which was, you know, the day jobs that we were doing. So we bootstrapped the business and just, I mean, when people say entrepreneurship is not for the faint at heart, they really mean it. Um, you know, scaling, trying to stay focused, making sure we didn't bite off more than we could chew, making sure we had product market fit, that when we were iterating feature sets, we were going out and getting the engineer's feedback and not just creating, you know, what we thought would be interesting, but really understanding what was most valuable to them. So we had to be very disciplined from the beginning. So I would say that that's been one of the biggest challenges. And, you know, we've now developed a process that always puts um, the engineers needs first. And we've got some really good super users who just, you know, give us very candid feedback. Like this is what would help make my life easier. These are the products I want to see. These are the sellers that, you know, they, they go out and tell sellers to get on our site on our behalf, which has been amazing because if they can't get their head around it, when the engineer says, get on mm -hmm. Champer and then I'll start buying from you, that, that resonates pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, I think the other the other thing was just sort of how the suppliers decide to invest in the channel. I mean, I think I mentioned I was 
in charge of sales and marketing. So I understood, you know, how this stacked up against other marketing efforts that suppliers invest in to try and um, meet the engineers where they're at. But it's like, if you're advertising, if you're at a trade show, you're sort of just blanketly putting your name out there, but you're not giving the engineers something they need that can make their life easier and meeting them where they want to be met, which is, you know, online. So they don't have to pick up the phone and call and wait for a quote and all that stuff. So, so the ROI is like unprecedented for anything in our space. But I think, again, it's just such a new model. People are like, wait a second, who moved my cheese? And we're doing something different in med device. And as you know, we are not like, you know, we're not at the forefront of innovating processes and systems. And so um, one of the things that's been spectacular is because the engineers have been so vocal and just said, you know, we want more products, we want them online, we we don't want to have to jump through all those hoops just to start iterating. It's really sort of made people um, show up and start investing in the strategy. Yeah. Well, we all love to hear success stories. I'm wondering, do you remember what your first sale was? All right. Maybe it was your second sale or your third sale. I don't know. One of the very early sales. Like, How, how did that first one happen? <laughs> well, we actually... so. It's gosh, that's a great question, Aaron. Nobody's asked me that. I remember our first seller that we signed because we were so excited, and then we were like, "Oh my oh, goodness, we actually, yeah, oh crap, we have, to, we have to build this." And so I actually went back yeah. to the CEO and I said, "This is our vision. Like that was a PowerPoint. The solution doesn't exist." And he said, "Yeah, you guys will figure it out. You've been in the industry forever. You're passionate about oh, it. Wow, just go get it done." And so we were like, "If we cash this check, there is no turning back." And um, <laughs> and we were just like, "Yeah, let's just go for." Um, but in terms of sales of components, I, I don't remember exactly. I know that there were a handful of um, early adopters, I would like to call them. We had a tubing supplier. We had a balloon supplier. We had a mandrel supplier. So those were some of our early adopters. And we had several sellers, probably five or six, I would say at that time, that committed to be on the site that were part of our MVP. So we actually launched a beta and we leveraged our personal network of engineers to say, okay, we've, we've now got this live, go out, start buying stuff. Um, so if, if I think about it correctly, it was probably one of the, it was probably the engineering consultancy that Katie, one of my co-founders was working for at the time. And she was like, guys, go find anything on the site and buy it so we can make sure, you know, everything works the way that we say it's going to work. But yeah, we definitely leveraged the existing engineering network we had in the early days. How fun. Wow. What, what a thrill. And, and I'll tell you one other thing. We actually ordered, the first order was ourselves, placing it ourselves and shipping it to us to make sure that like Making everything sure went works. okay and yeah. we got the product <laughs> and it looked good. So. Yeah, I've, I've done some of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let's see. Um, maybe just one or two more questions and, and then we'll we'll wrap things up here. Um, are, are there any new features or offers that engineers can look forward to in the future from Chamfer? Well, we, the payment terms is one we have, so we've had credit card, we've been able to take credit cards, you know, but P cards have limits and some people have access to them and other people don't. So we've been, people have long been asking for the ability to do net terms on the site. And um, I guess this is me broadly saying that we have that capability. We haven't actually promoted it broadly, but we've been working on it for several months and we have sort of, again, a beta version that's launched right now. But that's going to be broadly and commercially available in the next couple of weeks. So that's one of them. Um, we are actually working also, um, my team will probably, you know, chastise me for saying this publicly, but um, notify me when it's back in stock. So a lot of the, the inventory, as oh, I mentioned, fluctuates. Yeah. And so and if an engineer is there, I know time is, you know, of the essence and speed to market is the key. But that being said, a lot of times people want to know when a certain material or product or, you know, fixture isn't back in stock. So we are working on that particular function. And then honestly, we have a huge list of functional upgrades. Um, we've done some buyer surveys where we've reached out to our account holders and said, what products do you want to see? What materials, what functional upgrades? Um, and we have a whole list of product roadmap, if you will. Um, I would say the best way to find out when those features are coming live, I won't, you know, divulge all our secrets is to to sign up for our newsletter. Um, if you sign up for that, you're, you're sort of the first to know when new stuff becomes available and new features. Terrific. Very cool. Well, um, Julie, is there anything else that, uh, that, that we should talk about, about chamfer, how it helps engineers that we haven't covered already? I think the main thing is, again, we, we exist a hundred percent to service engineers at their point of need early on in the design process. So I would say if anybody's on the site, we read every single email that comes in. Um, we look at every single suggestion. Um, we take very seriously the buyer feedback. 
So if people have ideas or things they want to see, don't hesitate to submit it because, you know, we're not some big corporation where we're not intimately involved in in iterating the site based on what works for engineers. So that is 100% of our goal. And I'm excited that we're expanding the team. So we have a, a group of about, I think, nine or 10 of us now, and we are we're growing um, pretty fast. So we've got more bandwidth and we've got a solid dev team on the back end now. So we have the ability to execute more than we did, say, in the earlier days on um, some of these iterative improvements. Very cool. Well, Julie, congratulations on what you and your team have built thus far. I'm, I'm sure it's only going to get better. And it just seems like such a wonderful solution for all of the R&D engineers out there. Thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, we're really excited to to connect with you. And now you guys are doing great things. We hear a lot of good things about Pipeline as well. So it's fun oh, to be, appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. It's fun to be part of <laughs> you know the network that's really focused on this group and this stage of the process. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, um, so we we talked a little bit about there's the newsletter. They can sign up for that. Yep. Anywhere else that uh, people should go to learn more about Chamfer, or is it really just go to the website, sign up for the newsletter, and that's kind of the main thing. Yeah, just to reiterate, the website is C H A M F R, intentionally no E dot com. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter there. So you get first um first in the know of all the new product releases, seller onboards, um, feature set improvements. We're also on all the socials. So we have a, a link follow us on LinkedIn. That's where we do the most technical um technical update. So anytime a new product category is either replenished or new SKUs are in stock or a new seller, we always post on LinkedIn. We also have Twitter and Facebook, any of the socials, but um, certainly LinkedIn and the website are the, probably the two most commonly used. Love it. All right. Well, Julie, thank you so much again. Thanks, Aaron. I really appreciate it. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.